Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I am sitting here in the New York office and I actually, when I'm done recording, I'm gonna be running to the airport and flying back home. Been just kind of a short week, but definitely very action-packed. And not just action-packed in my schedule and meetings and so forth, um, but in, in the, and I'm not gonna say in the markets either. It's really been a, a remarkably subdued week in terms of market volatility, but it's been a very action-packed week in terms of uh, market events things that uh, theoretically could have caused a lot of price volatility, but were certainly headline uh, interesting events. And you start with the uh, Saudi um, attack, uh, Iranian drones uh, taking down half of Saudi's production capacity and oil over the weekend, leading to a 14% drop, in, oh, excuse me, 14% increase in the price of oil on Monday alone of this week. Uh, then you have the Federal Reserve and their long-awaited Federal Open Market Committee meeting announcing on Wednesday that they uh, were cutting rates uh, another quarter of a point. Um, and then you uh, there's all the kind of economic aftermath and repercussions and forward-looking projections and questions around that. Uh, the, so, you know, one, either one of those stories would have made this one of the bigger event weeks of the year, and you had both packed into a couple days. I'm recording middle of the day on Thursday. Dow is right now up about 100 points. Uh, yesterday, when the Fed came out with their announcement, it was late in the market day, as it normally is. Uh, I was sitting on set at Fox Business, uh, getting ready to you know, kind of discuss the aftermath of the Fed announcement live on air. And the market uh, was maybe up 30, 40 points. Um, at the time it came out, the market at one point dropped uh, as much as 200. It kind of bounced around in that range and it closed up 30 or 40 points on the day. So in that final hour of trading as the Fed made their announcement and uh, uh, Chairman Powell had his press conference, the market did move around a bit. I don't consider 100 to 200 points much even intraday, but from start to finish it didn't move at all. Uh, basically kind of a flat reaction. That's uncommon. We haven't had a lot of that um, in recent times. Um, and then now, as I said, we're sitting here Thursday, market's up about 100 points. So flattish week, you know, may, uh, maybe perhaps down a couple points, not much. We, it does, you know, we still have a little more time here on Thursday. We'll have all day Friday. So you really have had, um, from start to finish thus far, very low market volatility and even intraday and uh, day-by-day movement uh, considering the magnitude of some of the events, not much. Well, I'm going to start with the Fed, and then we're going to unpack the, the oil-related um, issues. Uh, the fact of the matter is that you uh, really had to be uh, out of consensus to expect anything different than the Fed cutting a quarter uh, point. Uh, there was one Federal Reserve governor who had a vote, who voted to cut uh, two quarter points, uh, 50 basis points. There were two Federal Reserve governors who voted to not cut at all. The rest voted with the one cut. So uh, this is what the Fed funds futures market had been pricing close to 100% for several weeks. In the days leading up to it, it came down a little bit in what those odds were, uh, which, will, which is you know bound to happen every now and then. But I really do believe that the bigger issue right now is what they do going forward. And I have a very hard time believing in anything like the dot plots, anything like the Federal uh, Reserve's uh, press release indicating, you know, we expect the next move will be a rate hike into next year. Um, the dot plots in June were anticipating no uh, action. They've cut rates twice since then. I bring up all the time Going into 2016, the dot plots were for four rate hikes, and they ended up not hiking at all. So I think that they are mostly right now stuck in the position of having to give the market no more than it wants, um, but not everything it wants, so as to leave themselves some optionality into the future. I think that the uncertainties on the trade war, their inability to create this inflation target that they want, um, most significantly being grounded to where 
uh, international bond yields are in a lot of cases in negative territory uh, has forced them uh, to take an overly dovish position. And one of the things I write about in DividendCafe.com this week is that this is a very bizarre um, position to be in because the way they're messaging it leaves you either unsatisfied one way or the other. So in other words, there's two messages they're giving. One is that this is these kind of last two rate cuts are not really necessary, but a form of what they are, this is their term, not mine, risk management, kind of an insurance cut. Um, and then the other line is, well, you know, we, we maintain that we're data dependent. But see, risk management by definition is not data dependent. They're talking about concerns around global growth slowing down. That's not a data point. It's a sort of abstract kind of broad fear. It may be a legitimate one. It may not be. But my point is into the hard data that is always driven the discussions on monetary policy, the unemployment rate, wage growth, GDP growth. This would not, you, you could argue for saying still, uh, some may argue for raising rates, you certainly wouldn't be arguing for cutting rates. Now, not all um, events are created equal. So the point for me right now is not to critique what they ought to be doing or what they're doing, but it's to get a gauge as to what's driving them and what we have to expect going forward. And um, I don't see the conditions that led them to cut these last two times changing much. Um, now, look, the Fed funds futures market, as of my very, very early wake up this morning, were suggesting greater than 50% that they would not cut again this year. Previously, the number had been 40% chance of cutting uh, one quarter point and a 40% chance of cutting two. So basically an 80% chance of some rate cut. That number is now dropped to below 50%. But it's still close enough that there's just this sort of uncertainty around it. Um, what do we expect this to do for markets? Well, markets haven't moved a whole lot, but they had already moved up a couple thousand points from that August bottom. So it's been a very robust number for markets, a robust activity in the month of September. Very similar to June. Last time you had a month, and it's only two months of the year that we're down, we're May and August, both driven by extreme um, bad news around the trade war front. Then the market started to get the feeling things were looking better. They rallied hard in June. In September, things looked like maybe it wa weren't escalating further with China. So after off of the August bottom, uh, markets rallied hard here in September. Um, my own take is that the Fed itself cutting rates another quarter of a point is not necessary for market action. Um, why do we feel that it is not very important? Well, I'm going to turn to my actual writing in DividendCafe.com. Um, okay, the, the point, you, you have to be able to wrap your arms around here. If you're listening to the podcast, watching the video, I want you to appreciate how different it is in the stimulative effect it provides to the economy to be cutting rates when you're practically already at zero versus cutting rates when you're at five, four percent, a larger number. The impact is magnified when you're starting from a higher rate. When you're already low and you're just going a little lower than already low, it doesn't have the same impact into the economy. What it does do is re-rate assets meaning it reprices the risk-free rate from which all other assets, risk assets, are themselves valued. So this is something I've talked about so much over the last few months, and I'm telling you, I'm going to be talking about it for years to come. When you go down the path of using manipulation of risk asset valuation to achieve a broader economic end, it opens you up to certain distortions. Can this be a benefit to markets? Perhaps. Can it be a big benefit to the real economy? I don't think so. Long term, the true causes of disinflation is not understood. If it is, it's not appreciated. And, and I don't just say that about the Fed. I say that about the media, about the investing public at large. So that's why this subject that I've been harping on for the last several months is so important to me as to what the negative pressure on growth is 
by oh, excessive spending, sovereign wealth funds, government indebtedness puts downward pressure on growth and therefore downward pressure on bond yields and creates this pressure. You see it in the European Central Bank. You've seen it in Japan for decades and you see it right now in the United States. Pressure on central bankers to try to make up the difference or or overcompensate for another macro effect that they can't really deal with, that they don't have a, a, a play to run. And that's where I think we're, we're at now. Okay, coffee break. Now let's talk about interest rates. So Fed funds rates a little lower. Yield curve is not steepening. Um, you would you would seen the 10 year, 30 year go a bit higher. 30 year is up about 25 basis points over where it was at the bottom level in September. But um, with a 10 year still, you know, well uh, below 2 percent, um, the fact of the matter is you're not going to get steepening in the yield curve unless you see the 10 year come up higher above two or they even come cut the federal funds rate another not just 25, but probably 50 basis points. Uh, it's gonna be very hard for them to do that. Um, so you already had a lot of movement in treasury yields, and, and that's perhaps why they had seen some move higher in the last couple of weeks, just because they were perhaps overdone a bit. Um, it's part of the normal zig and zag of markets, and we're not trying to trade our client bond portfolios around it. You wanna have a more stable macroeconomic outlook that you make bond decisions on and I think right now, um, being bit, a bit more defensive and also recognizing that credit has behaved very well. So that's why we've gotten really good price action in the corporate bond sector, especially investment grade, because people have not been worried about this as a corporate credit economic event. It's been far more driven just simply around interest rates, therefore having a bigger impact positively to the pricing of duration sensitive bonds. So let me kind of dig in a little bit to an outlook right now. I do think that a balanced, moderate, median exposure type approach to markets makes a lot of sense. And I love some of the stuff I wrote this week in the commentary. I hate reading myself, but I guess uh, you're here to listen to me, so you may as well listen to me reading me. I, uh, the Look, monetary policy is loose, it's accommodative, People would think that's a, a potential benefit to have a higher weighting of risk assets, but the trade war is still lingering. It's certainly uncertain. It's certainly problematic. So again, you have that push-pull. Um, fiscal policy is very pro-market. You've had big corporate tax reductions, incentives for businesses to invest, but fiscal health, very weak, excessive deficits, national debt, etc. The U.S., relatively strong. There's an absolutely insatiable global desire for U.S. assets, but on the other hand, the strong dollar that comes out of that is a real factor. It's impacting earnings for multinational companies, push-pull. Liquidity is certainly abundant, credit flowing, demand is high, cost of, capital, cost of capital is low, but earnings projections are themselves questionable, perhaps slowing around what had been earlier previous momentum. Uh, so as you go into what will be our next earnings season in another month, uh, you'll get a better indicator. But could it could it be a disappointing quarter? It very much could. Could it be an outperforming quarter? Of course. Both factors at play at once. Hopefully you get the idea. A number of factors where there's a very strong argument to be made and a, and a counter argument. What is the prescription here? Humility, sober mindedness balance. That's what we're doing, not only in our own thinking about this, but in the way we're executing in client portfolios. Uh, I'm going to probably wrap it up here. Um, as far as the issues out of Saudi Arabia, some great charts at DividendCafe.com for you to take a look at. Um, how significant it was to have 5.7% of the world's oil production go offline. Um, and yet, the reason why it didn't have a bigger impact and a chart there showing the increase in U.S. production, real life production, not just capacity, that has provided a buffer. The rest of the world could look at this and say, geopolitically, we're not at risk the way we would have been in the past pre-U.S. fracking revolution. Um, by the way, I titled 
that part of Dividend Cafe, a note for Elizabeth Warren. I'll let you read into that. So, oil, big story this week, the Saudi Arabia attack, the um, the situation with the Fed. Now, uh, what do markets look to next? Um, the, you, you're getting more and more kind of calming in energy markets and normalcy returning there. Oil is sitting above $58 a barrel. It had been above 60 uh, had not it had just simply hasn't moved out that much. It's been good for the energy stocks this week. We have a very healthy weighting there ourselves, but but it hasn't caused any kind of global impact uh, for the reasons that I've already discussed. Um, as far as with the Fed next, uh, I I will be utterly shocked if you get a rate cut in October. But um, maybe we end up teetering around here with a 50% chance of another rate cut in December. Perhaps it ends up being higher than that. If I'm a betting man, uh, I probably would try not to take this bet, but I would bet that they will end up cutting one more time. Uh, certainly going into 2020, I think you have to assume that they want to be in as neutral position as possible in election year where the market is not looking to them to be cutting or hiking. I suspect that's where they get. And, and other than if we go into recession, then I think you're going to see full-blown quantitative easing. I'm going to write an article next week uh, at Market Epicurean, a little deeper dive on some of the things that happened in the repo market this week. Um, I don't imagine a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a subject that's important. Uh, uh, Chairman Powell yesterday made a comment about looking to organically increase our balance sheet. And some people said, wait a second, is he talking about a QE4? Is this another round of quantitative easing? He's not, but I want to be able to unpack what that means. I think the best place for me to do that is in a little higher end article I'll write uh, that some of you may find interesting. Um, so with all that said, please do reach out with any questions or comments. Uh, I really am just as a constant bottom up, you know, company oriented, profits oriented investment mind, much more excited for earnings season to get started again. Uh, geopolitical events like the drone attack in Saudi Arabia is a big deal. It matters in our world. Uh, the Fed, I think, matters less and less at this point when you're, you're getting so close to the risk-free rate being back to zero. Um, but we have to pay attention to it. It has a pricing impact. It has a valuation or rating impact. Um, but really, you know, ultimately, what could really go right for markets is a strong earnings season. What could really go wrong for markets is a very disappointing one. Either outcome's possible, and of course, a middle of the road thing could happen as well. So th that doesn't kick off for another month, by the way. Um, all right, that's that. Uh, like I said, I have a plane to catch. I'm going to leave New York. The next time I'm back will be our annual trip, uh, Dea and Brian from my team, partners and members of our investment committee will be joining me and we'll be meeting with you know well over a dozen uh, of our primary portfolio manager relationships, asset managers, hedge funds, uh, strategists, uh, analysts, various people uh, that I, I find this week to, that uh, every year utterly stimulating and I hope you'll get a lot out of it as well. Uh, but that's that's a, a few weeks away. So in the meantime, going back to California and look forward to come back to you next week with more thoughts here in the Dividend Cafe. Thank you for listening and thank you for watching.